pre presented by Miguel Fabian Romero Ronda. So this is the work from University of Côte d'Azur, France. Right. So Miguel, you can start. Any questions? Uh, I'll be coordinating the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think your video will be played automatically in a short while. I think it starts. Mig So video is streaming on YouTube. Okay. Now. Hello everyone, I'm Miguel Romero and today we present our work on user adaptive rotational snap cutting for stream 360 degree videos. In this talk I will start by giving a brief introduction on why driving the user's attention is important from the perspective of the multimedia network community. Then I will present the problem of adaptive streaming of 360 degree videos and the different solutions for it. One of such solutions is dynamic editing with rotational snap cuts. Then I will present the model of the dynamic decision problem of snap cut triggering and after this problem definition I will show the method we use to learn how to trigger the snap cuts. Finally, I will show the experimental results we had and our conclusions. So let's start on checking why is it important to drive the user's attention. Driving the user's attention is critical for a director to ensure the story plot is understood. Consider the two cases shown here. In the left, the user's attention is not driven to watch the turtle from the beginning, and therefore it misses almost all the action on the video, when it realizes how the main action occurring is too late. When the attention is driven by simply repositioning the user in the main action at the beginning of the scene, the story plot is better understood by the viewer. However, in this work, we wanted to investigate attention driving techniques from a different perspective, that of the multimedia network community. Today we will discuss how driving the user's attention lowers the randomness of the user's motion and using this a priori knowledge in the streaming decision is beneficial both for application level metrics and user experience metrics. But how does adaptive streaming works for 360 degree videos? Before start talking about adaptive streaming of 360 degree videos, we need to talk about legacy adaptive streaming. It consists in the video file being chunked into temporal segments of fixed duration, each encoded into several quality levels at different bit rates or resolutions. Then the client tries to prevent interruptions by maintaining a playback buffer where some segments of the video are stored, while fetching and displaying qualities as high as possible constrained by the network bandwidth. However, to use legacy adaptive streaming in 360 degree videos is more challenging. Due to the closer proximity of the screen to the eye and to the width of the spherical content, the data rate to stream 360 degree videos may be two orders of magnitude that of a regular video. A solution to decrease the amount of data to stream is to split the sphere into tiles and send in high resolution only the portion of the sphere the user has access to at each point in time. The qualities to request for every tile of every segment must therefore adapt both to the network and the user dynamics. And if we consider buffering to smooth the playout, there should be a buffer per tile. In this figure we observe that the segment of each tile can be downloaded either in high quality in red or in low quality in purple. Ideally, the tiles in high quality must match the user field of view at their time of playback. This idealistic case can only be achieved if we predict correctly the field of view position. The challenge is that at the time of the download, the future of the network bandwidth is unknown and the user motion is unknown. One solution is to predict both the network bandwidth and user's motion with recurrent deep neural networks. However, Predicting such time series is difficult and can be done only over short horizons. Let us now discuss about a possible solution proposed to control the field of view instead of predicting it. The approach presented in the work of Sambra and others consisted in designing a 360 degree adaptive streaming algorithm which benefits of the knowledge of the future rotational cuts to better target which tile must be fetched in high quality. The principle of a snap change is to direct the user's attention to preselected regions of interest by repositioning the user in front of a new field of view in a snap. Since we know in advance which portions of the sphere will be observed by the viewer, we can buffer several seconds of video. The bandwidth savings yielded by such approach have been shown to be substantial, up to 25%. 
To allow dynamic editing with rotational snapcuts, an XML file is generated. It contains the time at which the snap should be triggered and the angular sector towards which the field of view of the user is moved. But can we do the process of deciding a snap change automatically? We will need to define, first, the region in the scene that are important for storytelling, and second, the time at which the snap is triggered. This is the focus of this presentation. For where to direct the snap cut, in this work we simply assume that the user's reaction doesn't depend on the field of view targeted by the snap cut. For when to trigger the cuts, we can consider that the snaps are arranged periodically, and our problem is now to decide if each of these snaps should be triggered or not. But are snaps always necessary? Consider the following cases. It would be annoying if even when the user is close to the snap cut, the field of view is still rotated. In the second case, the network bandwidth is high enough so that it's not costly to re-download in high quality the tiles that were already downloaded in low quality. In the third case, the user moves slowly enough so that the spatial qualities overlap sufficiently the field of view at the time of playback. If we observe the figure on the right, the user is not moving. This will give us a perfect prediction accuracy of the future tiles to send in high quality. Whether or not a cut will be beneficial is dynamic and depends on the user's motion and on the network conditions. Specifically the trade-off involves. Not having a snap change may preserve the level of presence and keep low the probability of disorientation. But a snap change guarantees that the user will see the field of view desired by the director and that high quality is displayed in the field of view. The optimal policy lies in between, where the snap frequency finds the best trade-off between these two options. Let's now observe the modeling of our problem. As mentioned before, a 360 degree streaming strategy has to be both network and user adaptive. In this work, we focus on how to adapt the frequency of the snap changes to the user's motion. Therefore, we fix the underlying streaming strategy. First, we consider that two quality levels are available, high quality and low quality. And second, the tiles download can occur up to p seconds before its playback, where p is the size of the playback buffer. We focus on how to adapt to the user's motion, so given a list of potential snap changes, when we need to decide whether a snap change should be triggered, we call a decision function. To formulate the decision problem, we adopt a model for the level of user's experience. We define an instantaneous reward obtained after the playout of segment N. This reward balances the trade-off between quality in the field of view and number of snaps triggered, with beta being the penalty for triggering a snap. The quality in the field of view over the duration of segment N is provided as the summation of the quality levels of each tile at segment N multiplied by the average fraction of field of view at segment N occupied by tile M. Beta is the penalty for triggering a snap. The more distant the last trigger snap is from the current segment, the lower the penalty. The snap triggering problem is a Markov decision process defined by the tuple S, A, P, R and Gamma. We denote S sub U as the state of the user and the streaming process. A is the snap triggering decisions that pace the time. Either we trigger a snap with A equals 1 or not with A equals 0. P is the probability to move to state S prime given that we are in state S and applied action A. Finally, R sub U is the total reward, the summation of average instantaneous rewards of the segments between two snaps. Let's now analyze the optimization problem. We define pi as the probability to apply action A, given that we are in state S. The optimal snap triggering strategy must therefore trigger a snap change when the contribution to the cumulative reward of the quality increase due to this snap exceeds the incurred penalty. The decision-making problem is that of a model-free reinforcement learning. We leverage here the principle of learning from experts' demonstrations, also known as imitation learning. We consider in this work the simplest version of imitation learning known as behavioral cloning. It consists in supervising the training of deciding whether or not to trigger a snap change with the trigger labels provided by an offline optimal. The optimal decision is computed using dynamic programming.
Now let's move to our implementation of the learning process on how to trigger a SnapCut. This figure shows the difficulties of modeling a SnapCut. We can see the timing of the process. At time t deck, we have two choices, either the snap is triggered or not. In case the snap is not triggered, there is a loose correlation between the past user's motion and the quality. The quality in the field of view in the interval in red is given by the overlap computed between these styles. In case the snap is triggered, then only high quality is displayed in the field of view, but this effect is only observed after time t deck plus b. We therefore split the snap triggering problem into two subproblems. The first problem is to predict the field of view overlap over this interval here in red using all available data from the past. The second subproblem is to decide whether to trigger or not based on the prediction of P1. Both decisions are taken at time t deck. To solve problem P1, we consider two options. The first solution is to use the overlap values before t deck as those of the future interval. The second solution is to predict the series of field of views in the future interval using the deep neural network architecture named TRACK. This network uses as input the series of field of views positions anterior to TDEC and the visual saliency extracted from the video. Now we move to our second part of the problem. The goal of the decision step is to classify whether the snapcat should be triggered or not. We use a decision tree to perform this classification. The inputs are set to be as close as possible to the rewards components. The future overlap values account for the quality in the field of view in the reward, and the second component of the reward is the relative snap position in time. Finally, we present the results of our experiments. We used the traces from real users of 20 seconds long videos and emulated the streaming process and the user's snap reaction. We present here the performance in terms of reward quality in the field of view and fraction of snap cuts triggered for different values of the buffer size and snap cut penalties. We can observe the general and expected trends from the results of the optimal. The optimal reward decreases when the buffer size or the snap penalty increase, so does the quality. The optimal fraction of triggers increases with the buffer size, but decreases with the snap penalty. Indeed, the higher the buffer size, the lower the field of view overlap. Then, more snap cuts are needed to get a high quality. However, if the snap cut penalty is high, a lower amount of snap cuts is allowed and the reward cannot be increased. Here we observe the results of overlap prediction and triggering decision for our methods track and past. On the left, we have the results for future overlap prediction. These results confirm the interest of using a refined field of view predictor to lower the overlap prediction error. On the right, we consider a refined upper bound baseline. GT stands for ground truth where the decision tree is fed with the ground truth future overlap. If we analyze its results, we observe how GT is relatively close to optimal when beta is small, but gets away from optimal when beta increases. This shows the need to consider a longer future horizon to make decisions when the snap penalty increases. Now, we would like to analyze the results for different baselines. As we said before, there is a trade-off between always triggering the snaps and never triggering the snaps. We define two baselines, zeros where no snap change is triggered and ones where every snap is triggered. If we get the results for the baselines, it's interesting to observe the gap between optimal and the best of both baselines, zeros and ones. The gap is greater for higher values of B and intermediate values of beta. In these cases, the methods past and track that don't assume any knowledge of the future are able to outperform in reward the zeros and ones baselines. However, when observing their snap cut triggering decision, we observe that for beta greater or equal than 0.3, they often are much more conservative than the ground truth, triggering almost no snap cut. In such case of high beta for high buffer size, the quality is impacted by the lower accuracy of future prediction. Finally, let's draw some conclusions from this presentation and define future research directions. In this work, we have investigated how to learn to dynamically trigger rotation and snap cuts. These snap cuts can benefit the user's experience, both by helping the stream process and improving the quality in the field of view. However, snap cuts may be avoided when they are not beneficial to the stream quality. We formulated the snap triggering optimization problem and investigated possible gains in quality of experience. Finally, we have shown that learning approaches are relevant to design online snap cut triggering strategies. We are also aware that this work is preliminary and suffers from several limitations. First, 
the performance of the proposed methods is limited by the difficulty of predicting overlap. To overcome this difficulty, it will be important to extract less volatile features, particularly we could use video or user profiles. Second, the considered model of quality of experience and user's reaction to a Snapcat are simplistic. Future work should carry out experiments to determine accurate models. We have considered the network state fixed and a simplistic streaming logic. Future work will design advanced network adaptive strategies, making use of user and content adaptive snapcutting strategies. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Miguel. So we have time for questions. Uh, uh, so I'll, there's a question on. Uh, Thank you, Miguel. So we have time for questions. Uh, uh, so I'll, there's a question. On, Hi, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here sorry, to present a lot of our work there, there's a question on designing Google. an adaptive Can you assistive Google read interface for learning virtual. Say it because I think Hi. my sound is. Hi. Testing the system with three. Uh, okay, nice work. Have you thought about testing the system with real users so to subjectively check if there is an improvement in quality of experience? Uh, yes, that's that's the idea now. Uh, we plan to. That's part of the future work, as I said in the presentation. This is a preliminary work where we try to define uh, more or less the model of the of the user's behavior. And uh, yes, we would love to to see. How it, uh, how our system performs with uh, actual users, uh, and and actually better define our model of the of the user behavior by analyzing actual users interacting with the with the system. So yes, yes, this is our plan for for future work. Okay, any other questions? Anyone? Uh, you can type the questions on the Google, uh, the YouTube chat window. You can type in the chat window of Zoom, or you can, you know, say them as well, right? Uh, okay. Then let's thank the speaker and uh, thank you. So uh, uh, thank you, Miguel. You know that's was a nice presentation. So the next talk is. Uh, uh, it will be also presented as a video, so please keep track of the YouTube link as only. I know it's a little confusing, so many things going on, but I think this will be streamed on YouTube, YouTube as a video also. And the talk is on designing an adaptive assistive interface for learning virtual filmmaking. Right. So this is a work from uh, NCU Taiwan and uh, University Côte d'Azur, France. And this will be presented by QZ if I spell that correct. Sorry if I don't. Okay, so over to you. So I think uh, the EGB person, can you play the second video now? Please, Alexander or who is there? You can play the second video now. Hi, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here to present our work on designing an adaptive assisting interface for learning virtual filmmaking. I am Zhi Sheng Guo from National Zhengzhi University in Taiwan. Here is the outline for today, and let's start from the background and introduction. Let me begin with the introduction to virtual film set. Film cinematography has the function of eliciting emotions from the audience. It influences not only how scripts were written, but also how the director chooses to direct the movie. To improve one's skills about cinematography, we believe that practice makes perfect. However, setting up a film set with real prompts and actors is really expensive, and it is not easily available to most of the novices. Recent work has proposed the virtual film set, which overcomes the situation. In this virtual film set, a user can act as a director, photographer, or an editor. As you can see, as a director, 
The user can design a number of cameras that should be placed by observing the whole film set from the god's perspective and the storyboard. As a photographer, the user is able to determine where to place the cameras in order to have the desirable framing. As an editor, the user is expected to arrange the story by composing a sequence of shots from the various camera streams. With these features, the user can practice more to get more familiar with those skills. Based on the work, we design an adaptive assisting interface for learning virtual film set, which integrates virtual reality, cinematography, and the scaffolding theory. Let's talk more about the scaffolding theory. Scaffolding theory was first introduced in the late 1950s by Jerome Bruner, a cognitive psychologist. Scaffolding represents the helpful interactions that enable the students to do something beyond his or her independent efforts. This support is specifically tailored to each student such that the scaffolds are incrementally removed when the students acquire the knowledge or skills under the learning target. This instructional approach allows students to experience student-centered learning which tends to facilitate more efficient learning than teacher-centered learning. Next, I will introduce our system design. We develop our system using Unity 3D and runs on the HTC Vive. Here is the architecture of the virtual film set system. The yellow one represents the character which the user is able to act as. For instance, a director, a photographer, or an editor. The red one, such as playback controls, got perspective, indicates several features that the user can experience in the virtual film set system. Also, we create a shot database, which enabled us to provide shot recommendation to assist the user. Here is the design of our assisting interface. We have three user models, novice, skilled, master. The user can choose different modes that best describes him. And then we provide the scaffolding tools like video, audio, text, pointer, image, and vibration to assist the user to finish the tasks we assigned. These are examples of different kinds of hints. For the video hint, we provide short clips to help users getting more familiar with such functions in the film set. For the set-by-set -set hint, the user may follow the steps appear on the screen. For the vibration hint, it is an indicator that tells the user he has achieved the goal of the task. What is more about our system is adaptive mechanism. According to the principle of instructional scaffolding, the assisting mechanism provided the user should be customized and adjusted dynamically as their proficiency improves. We have designed an adaptive mechanism to adjust the level of our assisting learning interface. In this adaptive mechanism, the user can provide active feedback to the frequency of the hints, such that the level of user proficiency can be adjusted immediately. Let me give you an example. There is a user operating our system. While he starts a task, we will begin to record the time. And after a time t, if a task has been completed, we will adjust the user model to a higher level. If the task has not been completed, we will provide more hint to them to him. For example, the system will repeat the task again through the headset, or the pointer will appear in a more noticeable way. In order to evaluate our system, we design the experiments. First of all, a survey of the experiences of the participants in cinematography and using VR-related systems has been conducted before our experiment. At the beginning of the experiment, a participant will select a level which best described how, he, how familiar he or she was with the film set, virtual film set. And during the experiment, a participant was required to finish three main tasks 
which would teach him how to film a sequence in the virtual film set. The main texts were comprised of knowledge about the basic controls, still photography, and dynamic photography. Each of which will consist of multiple subtests. After that, we ask the participant to fill out the questionnaire to evaluate our work. We invited 24 participants with their diverse background, and divided them into three groups, adopting a between-subject design in our experiment. The first group was the control group, that was only offered the step-by-step -step tutorial outside the virtual environment which means that the participant will not see any instructions inside the virtual film set. The second group was the first experimental group that was provided learning assisting interface with a fixed setting. This means that the user in this group did not have the access to our adaptive functions, and their level of proficiency will stick into the initial setting and would not change throughout the course of the experiment. The third group was a second experimental group that were provided with both the learning assisting interface as well as the adaptive mechanism described in the previous section. Okay, let's move to the result. In this table, we show the statistic of the three groups of participants on their prior knowledge, perceived difficulty levels, and the time they used in the experiment. We use questionnaires to acquire the prior knowledge and perceived difficulty. The questions about the prior knowledge include the level of understanding of VR, the basic knowledge of camera shooting. We use a 10 point scale for the participants to rate with 1 means the user has no prior knowledge and 9 means he is an expert. The perceived difficulty of a text is based on the subjective evaluation of the difficulty of completing all three texts on a scale of 1 to 20 points from the most easiest one to most difficult. The nullity test is applied to the prior knowledge of the three groups of users, and the result shows that there is no significant difference among them despite that their averages differ. We have also found that, for the three groups, the correlation coincidence for KVSD are all below 0.4, which means that there is no strong relationship between the prior knowledge and perceived test difficulty. In this table, we show the evaluation of different types of hint. Among these hints, the participants seem to be most satisf satisfied with pointer hint and vibration hint and they think that these are effective for learning virtual film set. Especially the pointer hint received the highest score. The participants consider that this hint helped them, helped, helped them efficiently in complex multi-step operations. However, the average score for the video hint is 3 points, which is lower than expected which means that video hint is not very effective. According to the user feedback, the sound of the video seems to be too low, and the speed is too fast to understand the content clearly. This problem will be corrected in our future work. We also asked the participants in two experimental groups to rank their overall experience with the system on the scale of 1 to 5 with 1 for most disagree and 5 for most agree on these three statements. It is clear from the results that the third group responded more positively towards the statements. Also, the standard deviation of each question is lower than that of the second group. We think this indicates that the adaptive mechanism is an effective way for learning the operations of the virtual film set. The last part is our conclusions and future work. In conclusion, we propose an adaptive assisting interface for learning virtual filmmaking based on the scaffolding theory. Our system guides the user in operating a virtual film set by providing text and vocal messages that are adaptive to each person's skill level and performance. 
We also evaluate our system by 24 participants shows the effectiveness of our system design. Future work. We would like to enhance our user models. Now we have three simple user models, and we hope to add more models and more parameters from different aspects. In that case, we can provide more suitable lessons for our user. Also, design more hints and cinematography tests in order to assist the user to get more familiar with the virtual filmmaking. Thanks for your listening. Thank you. So I think uh, Kyuze, you will be taking the questions here. Okay. So yeah. you can switch on your video. Yeah. So the, there's, there's one question on the Google chat, which I'll repeat. So it says, great talk. Have you thought about extending the interface to learn VR filmmaking? So. Uh, yes. So you can read the question on Google. Uh, you know the YouTube chat. If yes, uh, it is our uh, directions of our future work. So uh, in the future, we may um, consider the interface to learn uh, VR filmmaking. Yes. Okay. Any questions? Anyone else? You know, so you can also do a interactive discussion on Zoom, right? So okay. you can use your audio right now. You know, I'm just saying others. You know, you can switch on your video and audio and ask the questions in Zoom as well. So, or uh, someone else, I'll just say any other questions there. Okay. So. Okay. Then. Uh, I think, Hello. thank you, thank nice you to you the are. authors, you know, we'll I'm move to the next you. talk, then the next talk is, uh, uh, it's an invited paper, so it's an invited talk, so uh, it's the title of the paper is Exploring the Impact of 360 Degree, uh, 360 Movie Cuts in User Attention, and it'll be, I suppose, will be presented by Carlos, right, so I think we can play the third video and just a request to the host can you move uh, mahari Nielsen to the stage in uh, in the discord because he or she is not visible right now and he you know that's the last talk of the session so please request it and over to you carlos yeah okay so you can play the video the third video thank you yeah hello my name is Minona Radut. I'm a junior engineer with the R&D department of BBC and I'm going to talk about the possibilities and challenges involved in determining the quality of automatically produced video material. To start, I would like to introduce the sort of output we are aiming to evaluate with a short demo. Here's uh, two new cards. And Craig, will you look at your cards and come up with a story? Um, this is really difficult now. I might actually just start making up complete nonsense <laughs> facts. And oh, not you me. haven't been doing I, that. I, I, have, I have not. No, I, what, what I've been saying is the, true to the best of my knowledge. I saw an interesting thing on the television. And it was talking about food and texture and about how texture is really useful in knowing what flavour is. And they were trying out cucumber as a solid thing and as a, as a liquid. And people yes. couldn't tell it was cucumber when it was in liquid form. That's interesting. Ah. Yeah, that is interesting. I can never tell what flavour crisps are unless I've been told. <laughs> Even really obvious ones. Um, so, Craig, are you... I have a story. You have a story, okay. Um, tell some story. The Earth prototype is a system which was created to serve live events which normally would not have extensive video coverage due to the costs involved, but which would be viable if done using unmanned cameras, and has been developed with the use case of panel shows in mind so far. So that works by receiving recordings from several synchronized cameras and microphones and attempts to generate attractive framings of close-ups, medium close-ups, mid-shots, long shots, and so on, based on face landmarking and active speaker identifications. 
The change from one shot type to another is done by selecting a crop from a pool of candidates according to a mark of transition matrix, which is derived from an archive of human produced panel shows. Another important decision made automatically is the moment at which to cut to a different shot. The shot sequencing attempts to make shot changes near speech events while conforming to user set shot duration boundaries. It basically works by planning cuts at regular intervals based on the given parameters and then, if possible, adjusting the cut to coincide with somebody starting to talk or stopping talking. Now that we've set the context of how that works, and also keeping in mind that it is a prototype which is still being iterated upon, it's important to consider the quality of its output. This poses a bunch of questions which need to be addressed. The overarching goal is to determine whether the videos ad produces could be good enough for audience members to enjoy watching. And for that we need to figure out where the threshold of acceptability is. Does automated output have to be as good as that produced by human experts? Is it enough to be better than just a single static wide shot of the set? The algorithms can produce detection errors or suboptimal selections. What is the tolerance for these failures? Do audience members mind or even notice some of them? Which aspects affect the overall quality the most? What even constitutes good editing? Based on what seems to be general agreement from the filmmaking community, editing plays essential roles in creating the illusion of filmic space, establishing continuity between what would otherwise be disparate shots, and setting a rhythm for the final piece. For example, the clash of effect demonstrates how a neutral face can be interpreted as expressing sadness, hunger or lust when presented in the same context as imagery associated with those feelings, highlighting how editing creates meaning in films. Good editing draws attention to what the creator has deemed to be important and, at least in the continuity editing paradigm, the editing is hidden by exploiting the human attentional system in order to preserve the impression of a coherent space. This only makes it more difficult to assess editing since it's usually unnoticeable unless something has gone wrong. Continuity editing rules aim to lessen the burden on the viewer by making the narrative easier to understand. Probably the most well-known and easiest to enforce is the 180 degrees rule, which states that following an establishing shot, characters should preserve their own screen sc spatial relationship within a scene. This is done by making sure that on a cut, the new camera position is within the same half plane as the previous ones. Switching between shots with different background colors would introduce discontinuities. This image also illustrates the shot reverse shot structure which would occur between B and C. Another rule is the 30 degrees one, which states that the camera angle shift between two consecutive shots of the same subjects should exceed 30 degrees in order to avoid jump cuts. Eyeline matching relies on viewers following the eyeline of the characters on screen so placing an object of interest in the new shot, where the gaze would fall, ensues continuity. There are multiple studied effects of editing on the viewers, and it is known to have a role in memory and attention, as mentioned previously, regarding the attentional theory of continuity editing, as well as in the LC4MP model. Editing also affects the emotional impact of the content by omission or addition of shots, or by the type and length of shots being used. It also drives narrative comprehension and cut placement is usually measured against event segmentation, with cuts near the start of a new event being easiest to mask. Also, editing creates rhythms which usually complement the beats of movement and motion in a shot. In a more general sense, continuity aims to preserve or enhance viewer immersion by allowing them to focus on the content as it is presented. Immersion as a scientific concept is a bit unclear, since multiple partially overlapping concepts are used to describe similar experiences, such as engagement or involvement. Immersion has a strong effect on enjoyment, narrative effectiveness, and emotional responses it elicits, and also has a large presence in experimentation related to various media. The measurement of immersion is usually done through self-administered questionnaires. In this case, the most relevant one would be the Film Immersive Experience Questionnaire, a 24-question survey with answers based on 7 point Likert scale, looking at captivation, transportation, real-world dissociation, and comprehension of video material. It is essential to look at how other similar projects approach the evaluation of their systems. 
I would like to mention that the issue of evaluation has been discussed in a workshop paper by Lino et al. in 2014, which suggests direct assessment through subjective measurements or the empirical study of editing effects as a proxy for quality. Coming to a similar conclusion to that of our investigation, and also highlighting that in the last six years not much progress has been made in establishing thorough guidelines and testing suits similar to those present in network communication systems. Still, virtual and intelligent cinematography systems are being developed, and the general consensus is that community editing rules should be followed where possible as a way to ensure quality. The evaluation itself is usually done by comparison to degraded versions of scenes in order to assess the improvements introduced by new algorithms, or by comparison to human professional editing. The next step in planning the evaluation is to set the testing variables based on the parts of the system which might lead to issues. We have identified some relevant aspects which should probably be tested. The first issue which might arise is detection failure by the machine learning algorithms, leading to biased representation of the speakers. How big of an issue this is remains to be determined for now. Then there is the fact that shot duration is set by user when running the input through add, which could lead to unsuitable pacing, forced or unnecessary edits. Also, at faster cutting rates, the shot length variability becomes smaller, which could lead to very predictable cuts. Finally, the number of cameras used to shoot the material, as well as their placement, is essential to the resulting output and can pose issues such as jump cuts due to bad alignment. Based on this, the variables used in the design of the study are clip duration, since it would be useful to know whether the length of a clip affects how much tolerance for badness viewers have, shot duration, which is the edit rate, and here we selected a set of shot lengths which include a very fast one, which is 1.5 seconds per shot, a fast one at 3 seconds per shot, two average ones at 5 and 7 seconds, and a slow one with 10 seconds per shot. We also included an unedited clip, which presents a static long shot of the set as a comparison point for the experiences of other shot durations. Another variable is the precision to the shot durations, with some clips not employing the shot selection adjustment algorithm, leading to perfectly timed cuts of the same duration, irrespective of the content. Then there is the consistency of the editing, where some clips stop being edited halfway through and settle on the same long shot view as in the unedited videos. The point of this variable is to test the viewer expectations of consistency in edit style and tolerance for failure. Finally, we try to probe whether the viewing platform affects the perceived quality of the clips. Our prediction is that expectations will be higher for content which might be broadcasted on television. The study itself consists of asking each participant, who are all non-expert members of the general audience, to view seven clips from the corpus of 120 clips, a subset being selected through a Latin square design in order to achieve balance across experimental conditions. Each participant ends up viewing an example clip to get familiarized with the task, an unedited clip, a discontinuous clip, and four clips of different shot durations and variability. Half of the clips are presented as being intended for broadcast, while the other half as intended for publishing on a streaming platform. For the duration of the study, we avoided mentioning that we are interested in editing in particular, in order to not bias how participants view and assess the quality of the clips. Participants assess the clips by answering five questions selected from the film IEQ, rating the extent to which the statements apply to the experience of watching each clip. After each clip, they are offered the possibility to comment on their responses or provide additional feedback. At the end of the study, participants go for a short section regarding the importance of editing in contrast to other factors, for example, lighting and set design. We have yet to deploy the full study, but have gone through a round of piloting and have brought in some members of the public to participate in person in order to gather more qualitative data before deployment. We have gathered some insights from doing so, even though it's still too early to draw any conclusions. Despite not being directly assessed, the choice of content seems to be very important, as even when explicitly asked to disregard the content and focus on the presentation, participants still found that the quality of experience was strongly influenced by what was being said in the clips or how interesting or boring they were. 
Another finding is that there is a wide difference in perception of edit rates, with some participants finding the very fast editing condition to be distracting, while others not really noticing it at all. And that's all from me. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Miruna, for interesting talk. So, any questions now? So, uh, Miruna will take the questions. You know, so you can post the questions. You can post the questions on either the Google chat, uh, the YouTube chat, or the uh, you can discuss it live here as well. Okay, so. Any questions? We'll wait for a minute because every time I say go, someone asks a question somewhere. Uh, so, so there's a question from KL BM, right? So he says, can you just tell us a bit more how the study was evaluated? So, um, in what way are you actually asking about the study or the? system that we are evaluating yeah, so okay because the probably, yeah the study you, itself um hasn't been um released yet so it's a bit early to tell whether or not it works <laughs> So yeah. Yeah, but um, I also have a question, Miruna. You know, yeah. so there have been few papers studying this. You know, yeah. uh, they have formalized a little bit. Also, I think it will be interesting to study. Like, so one paper formally studies four aspects. You know, one is narrative effectiveness. You know, and uh, how was the overall experience? You know, were the actions covered? Were the emotion covered? There are many aspects. So, for example, uh, a speaker detection, let's say algorithm which only tries to switch to who is speaking, may probably miss out on actions, for example. On the other hand, uh, something which is on speaker may probably do fine on the emotions and so on. So, I think uh, some things on the kind of activity would be also interesting to add. You, know, you, you would like to comment on that a little bit? Um. Yeah, it, it would be interesting to evaluate that indeed. <laughs> um, we haven't considered that yet because we wanted to focus more on um, the general acceptability of the video rather than on the emotional impact, which is a bit more nuanced. Okay. Okay, so any other questions? You can type it on the Google chat or, you know, you can say it Live. So Mark has a question. So have been have you been thinking of evaluating different styles in edits, all respect to editing rules, but display different impacts? So you can read the question. Um. Well, it's a bit out of scope for us because the system itself works for um, panel shows. So that is the style that we are evaluating here. Okay, Mark, you like to follow up? Clear. You can do it on the chat also, Mark. Yes. On your video, audio. Yeah. Better with a with the microphone. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But are the different actually styles in uh, in these type of talks different ways of shooting things that would be that would be valid? Well, yes, but um, the system itself is driven by um, data from panel shows, so that would mean we would have to um, do models of different, select different styles of talk shows and then do models of them and then implement it into the system in order to evaluate it. Um, so it is a possibility for the future. Okay. okay. Thanks.
Uh, okay, thank you. So let's thank Meruna. Okay, so the next uh, the next talk is uh, uh, now. I think we should push Carlos. I am a bit confused also. I think, but let's say I think by all means it should be uh, invited talk like uh, you know from University of Zaragoza. You know, so the the title is exploring the impact of three sixty degree movie cuts in user attention. Okay, so we can start that yeah on the YouTube. Okay. So we can play the video. The next one. We're waiting for the video to be played. Um, VR offers a new medium to tell stories. However, there is controversy between content creators in how to tell a story effectively. Unlike traditional cinema, now viewers have freedom to explore the 360 degrees that surrounds them. And this new game of freedom opens many possibilities for content creation, but also makes video filming and editing in VR particularly challenging, since it's not clear anymore how to control the course of the action in order to make sure the user doesn't miss any relevant details of the story. Let me explain this with an example. In the world following virtual reality scene, let's suppose that there is a viewer who observes the girl playing the violin, and maybe uh, as he loves music, he spends the whole scene watching her. Now, we have a second viewer who doesn't like violins, for example, and gets easily bored. So he decides to explore the scene, and suddenly he realizes that there is two people looking through the door. Now he can deduce who the girl's parents are. Now each of the viewers have different information from the narrative. It's difficult to tell a story in VR, because viewers can freely explore the 360 degrees of the scene that surrounds them losing some key narrative aspects, and they may not follow the director's intentions. From now, we are going to call the parts of the scenes that contribute to the narrative regions of interest. In this case, the regions of interest are the girl playing the violin, and also the two people looking through the door. But what happens with those regions of interest when jumping from one scene to another scene? Well, this is how 18 in VR looks like. Users go from one 360 wall to another. 
each of these 360 walls have a number of potential experiences, since each clip may have one or several regions of interest. The content creator can try to evaluate the probability that a user will follow a certain path through the 360 clip. And a common approach is to rotate these walls according to align the different regions of interest at cuts. Try to create a pleasant experience for the viewer. And what has been done so far? On the one hand, there are works which analyze user behavior in narrative via content. We can also distinguish those works which derive the user attention by using, for example, five flies or flickering. However, the previous work which is more related to ours is the work of Serran and colleagues in 2017, which proposed a systematic analysis of viewing behavior across movie cuts in VR content. These frames you see here are some examples from the work. As you can see, they are simple videos specifically designed for their intended analysis, limiting the scope and applicability of the results. Such videos lack the complexity of a real footage edited by professional filmmakers and were not designed for storytelling. This means that there is a lack of realism in the videos. And we addressed this issue and proposed the first analysis of user behavioral data watching professionally edited 360 degrees video content. One of the main challenges of this is that a real footage is not intended to be analyzed, making it hardly parametrizable. So, our final goal is to analyze user behavior across movie cuts boundaries. And thanks to our analysis, we derive useful information for VR content creators. As I have said, we are going to analyze user behavior across movie cuts boundaries. And to reach this goal, we have followed a set of tasks. Firstly, we need some data of watching a professionally edited VR movie. We have used the data generated from Frank and Paul, which are one of the most reputable studios when creating VR movies. The movie we have chosen to analyze user behavior is The People's House. We have available more than 3,000 health tracking information collected in the wild, with no restrictions or any particular task. This number of users is far away from previous work, which is limited to the order of about 50 users at most. In order to create our stimuli and carrier experiment, we have identified a set of key parameters of influence that may influence intentional behavior, which I'll describe next. We have distinguished two types of scenes, those that have a region of interest and those that don't. Thus, the different type of cuts will be studied, and depending on the scene before and after the cut, their possible combinations arise. A scene with a region of interest and then is followed by another scene with a region of interest a scene with a region of interest before the cut, and then a scene with no region of interest appears after the cut, and so on. In total, four possible combinations arise. And how does a cut look like? Well, in this example, we saw the six lakh seconds of the first scene, then the cut is produced, and then the first six seconds of the scene after the cut are shown. And also in the example, there is an overlapped heat map, that represents where most users are looking at. So, the, as we can see, the sixth last second of the scene before the cut are shown, then the cut is produced, and the six first seconds of the second scene are shown. And in order to analyze the effect of the scene before the cut in the scene after the cut, we analyze the seconds of the scene after the cut. So, now we have identified the parameters of influence, let's see how to analyze all data available. We need to develop a set of new metrics that will allow us to quantify user's behavior for all or all of different conditions. In Serrano's previous work, a series of metrics are proposed. From those metrics, we have adapted three of them. The first metric counts the number of frames after the cut until the user's gaze reaches the region of interest. This metric is an indicative of the time taken by the user until he converts again to the main action. In this example, if the user is looking at the blue dot at the beginning of the scene, he has to reach the region of interest. And this, is, this time is what this metric is trying to measure. 
the second adaptive metric is the percentage of total fixations that fall inside the region of interest. The purpose of this metric is to quantify the interest of the viewer in the region of interest. And a fixation is when the user is paying attention. So this is what we want really to consider. In this example, we can observe that most of the fixations fall inside the region of interest, meaning that the user is highly interested on it. The third adaptive metric is the number of fixations with respect to a total number of case samples. A low value corresponds to a higher quantity of seconds, which in turn suggests a more exploratory behavior. It is worth noting that this metric can be applied for scenes that have a region of interest and those that don't, while the previous ones can be only applied to scenes with a well-defined region of interest. In the following example, we can observe how users fixate firstly on the sofa, then on the desktop, and then on the other sofa, showing a more fixating behavior. And following the line of measuring the capacity of exploration, we have created the metric total tablet distance that measures the accumulated distance traveled after the cut. We have also created a metric percentage of the scene watched, which computes the percentage of the PR environment actually watched. This is an indicative of how much of the scene has been actually explored. So now we know how to analyze our data, we are going to discuss some of the most interesting insights. And please refer to a paper for the complete analysis and all the insights. Well, in the following scene combination, when the cut is produced and then there is a region of interest in the second scene, our results suggest that users take more time to reach the region of interest when there is previously a scene with no region of interest. This is because users are scattered around the scene and they have to refocus their attention. Surprisingly, users are more focused on the region of interest of the second scene if they have been also in a scene with no region of interest. And how can we apply this knowledge to a VR movie? Well, if the content creator would like to improve the level of attention in a scene which is key to understand the narrative of the movie, it is recommended to put a scene that has no region of interest before the cut. Finally, thanks to our new suggested metrics, in the following scene configurations, always that there is a scene with a well-defined region of interest before a cut, no matter where the nature of the second scene are, because users will show a more exploratory behavior. To sum up, our contributions are the following. We analyze a professionally edited VR movie. And where most previous works analyze toy scenes, we analyze a movie where the narrative has a high impact and it has been made to entertain the audience. We also take into account data of more than 3,000 users collected in the wild. We adapted previous metrics and created two new ones, tablet distance and percentage of the scene watched and we derive insights with implications in VR cinematic content. Regarding the limitations, we have analyzed a film of documentary nature, which implies that the action is scarce, there are no conversations between characters and there is little movement on stage. It could be interesting to analyze how our insights will extrapolate to content of other nature. However, our work and previous work share similar insights, so it seems some basic behaviors are common. And other limitation is that our proposed metrics tablet instance and percentage of the scene watched assume a static region of interest. They could be adapted to moving region of interest cases by taking into account the metric value when the user is not fixating inside the region of interest. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Carlos, for the nice video. We'll take the questions now. So this time we already have a Just video. One, question. one clarification <laughs> before going through the questions is that this work is also uh, in line with the Diego Sutierrez uh, keynote because he will also talk about all the problems that telling a story in VR means.
So, yeah, we can go through the questions. <laughs> Tiffan, if you're there in the Zoom, you can ask the question itself or I can repeat it for you. So, there's a question on, uh, I think, Stephen, I don't see you on uh, Zoom. So, the question is, uh, have you looked into how attention varies when people view the movie for a second time? You know, is this something that you already had to take into account in your analysis? Well, the problem is that we use data generated by users, but we don't know exactly if a user has uh, watched this, the, the movie a second time. So we don't really know, but we have lots of users. So we can mm, extrapolate all the data. But yeah, that's a thing that would be nice to take that into account. But there was lots of users, and we cannot know if they have been the, the movie more than once. Okay, Stephen, I hope that is clear. Any other questions by anyone? So, uh, I have a question. So here yes, you analyze Miguel. the inter-scene cuts. Do you plan to follow this analysis for intra-scene cuts? So cuts that occur inside a scene? Yes, could you speak a bit louder, sorry. <laughs> okay. So I'll repeat, I'll request Miguel, okay? If you, yes, okay. Uh, so you go ahead, yeah. So. I think I had the same question, but Miguel has asked it. So he's saying that you're looking at, are you looking at the cuts in the same scene? That's what you meant, right, Miguel? Yes, exactly. So, so in the same scene, so you are showing two videos. If I cut from this video to another, what is happening? Did you consider an idea where you're cutting inside the same scene? Right. Uh, sorry, if you, do you mean if that there is the same scene in two different cuts? Yes, so in, it's a 360 degree video, right? So you can cut in the same video itself. Right? You can, you're looking somewhere, then you cut to somewhere else when you show the move, right? You know, that's what he's asking. Yeah. Okay, if I have understood well the question, I think that we have discussed those scenes that have uh, very similar. I mean, if Obama, for example, is speaking twice, uh, we only consider one of those scenes. Is that the question? <laughs> no, I think so. So let's say there are two people speaking in the scene. Yeah. A VR ah, okay, 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 okay. okay. I, I know. Uh, no, because in those scenes, we only consider it's only a, in this movie, is only a region of interest at once in in every scene. So there is not that problem. It could be as a future work if we analyze another movie with different number of region of interest and the things. Yes. <laughs> okay. Miguel, I hope you want to follow up. Miguel? Yes, yes, yes. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so let's thank Carlos uh, for the interesting video and the discussion. You know, uh, thank you. So, so the next next presentation is uh, uh, industry talk, right? And uh, that is on the Cinecast story manager. Is that fine? Is that correct, Helen? Just Say that now since our schedule has gone a little bit i think so it's on it's a it's a video she says so helen can you just say which is the next talk so i am a bit yeah can you just announce the author in the title a little bit confusion on my end the yeah. next talk is industry talk uh, towards a new empirically driven language of cinematography and it is a recorded talk with the idea of 1002 yeah. Hi, I'm Mary Finlayson, and I work for the Artificial Intelligence and Media Production team at BBC Research and Development. The team started with a simple premise. What if we could cover events like the Edinburgh Fringe as widely and as in detail as we can cover the Olympics? One of the major reasons we can and don't do that right now is the people power required to film and edit that together. If, instead, you could put a small number of 4K video cameras at the back of a venue at the Edinburgh Fringe and leave them there to film, with the output run through an automatic editor, then edited footage of currently completely unaccessible content could be made much more widely accessible. This work is still in progress, and the work described in this talk is part of the research towards this goal. Such a process would require a system that understands how to frame individual shots. However, the language of cinematography, written in scripts, 
and used by camera operators to frame media, relies heavily upon human intuition, knowing what body parts not to cut off and how to frame empty space. And additionally, it relies upon the camera operators and editors own media experiences, a knowledge of framing born from media consumption. A computer clearly lacks these advantages and goes without the unsaid assumptions of human-driven cinematography. By building an empirically driven language of cinematography, taking advantage of a vast archive of media to learn about the framing decisions that humans intuitively make, and building a new framework for describing shot types based on this archive, we may ultimately enable a system to make more human-like framing decisions. In order to develop this shot type description, we developed a simple pipeline for frame analysis that you can see on the slides. The general pipeline works on individual frames and begins with feature detection, followed by dimensionality reduction, and then the resulting data is clustered to find the common shot types. The feature detection is an image processing operation that gives us information about each pixel of the image. Dimensionality reduction is the process of reducing the number of variables under consideration down to a few of the most influential variables. We can then experiment with using a variety of different techniques at each stage of this pipeline in order to work towards the best representation of the data. The first feature detector experimented with was Densepose, which was in part made by the Facebook research team. You can see an example of it run on a single frame on the slides now, and you can see how it correctly identifies the outline of a person from this BBC image. It maps, it detects human pixels in an image and maps them to their body part. The first data set we chose to explore was EastEnders, chosen specifically for the dense post feature detector because it's got very people dense shots given it's a soap opera. Shot detection was run on a subset of the episodes and the middle frame of each shot was then extracted. We take this mid frame to be representative of the shot as a whole. Using this method, approximately 200,000 still images were extracted. Densepose was then applied to these 200,000 shots. For the dimensionality reduction stage, principal component analysis was chosen, which keeps the trends of the high dimensional data. However, it reduces it down to a more manageable size for further computation, as well as giving us interesting information about what axes the original images vary the most along. The reduced dimensionality data was then clustered using k-means clustering. K-means clustering is an unsupervised learning technique, which is useful for finding unknown groups in complex data sets, as we have here. One of the advantages of using k-means is that we can remove our own assumptions about what groups and consequently shot types might exist in the data. For the EastEnders dataset, in a k-value of 9, the following nine clusters were identified. The first eight clusters visibly resemble shot types you might expect to see in media, particularly in a soap opera. We commonly found a final cluster, in this case cluster number eight, that seems to encompass many shots that did not fit into the other designations. We then chose to explore the Deep Gaze 2 salience feature detector, which is a model that predicts where people look in images. It produces a log density map of their fixations. You can see examples of it here. Blue indicates a more salient region, while red indicates a less salient region. As you can see, it predicts human fixations on faces, words, and animals, such as in the frame from Blue Planet at the top. There is previous work done by Smith et al, which is indicative of a general convergence of gaze in edited video. This suggested to us that gaze may be one of the factors that is manipulated by editing, which drove the decision to choose salience as our next feature detector. It also had the benefit of expanding our framing exploration beyond people-centric media. The Deep Gaze 2 saliency predictor tends to predict that humans will look at faces and bodies, as they do, but it also picks out prominent objects and other points of focus. To take advantage of the new capabilities provided by the salience feature detector, one of the new datasets we looked at was the most recent series of Blue Planet, which demonstrated a few interesting patterns. So we can see these clusters here. Again, these were generated using Deep Gaze 2 salience, um, principal component analysis, and k-means clustering with a k-value of 9. We can see with cluster number 5, 
and cluster number two, quite a distinct um, two-thirds salient, one-third unsalient kind of pattern, and some other interesting clusters. And we can see some of the images that fall into those clusters on the next slide. It's easy to see how these images match with these clusters. Um, with cluster number zero, you can see that the animal is a the animal in each one of them is highly salient in the centre of the right side of the screen, almost on the third mark. And in cluster number five, you can see that the bottom two thirds are have something you might want to look at, whereas the top third is not as interesting. Since we are looking for a universal language of cinematography on a frame by frame level, we needed to put together a data set that spanned genre and production team. So we put together a data set of 72,000 frames, deliberately selected from across different genres and productions. This would give us a data set that was representative of different framing styles, and that would be made by different people making different decisions. The results of this data set should then be more representative of wider cinematographic rules, as opposed to genre specific choices. You can see the results of, again, principal component analysis and key means clustering on salience, only 72,000 frames from a variety of different data sets. Some of the patterns look reasonably sensible and familiar. Um, cluster number one, for instance, perhaps being a person framed at the center of the shot. We can also see in cluster number 10, um, sorry, not cluster number 10, this is cluster number three, and how, um, and this is of the two different salient points of focus on the screen. And you can see how some of these frames look very similar in some ways. Some of them look different, but again, have two salient points of focus, which is why they fall into this cluster. From further exploration of this intergenre data set, reducing it down to 10 dimensions and generating 20 clusters, we applied a percentage variance explained measure and found that we could explain 57% of the variance present in the 72,000 frame data set. We are currently in the process of exploring different component analysis and clustering techniques in order to find the best representations of the data set. Hierarchical clustering is one alternative to k-means. It's a bottom-up clustering technique that groups together clusters one at a time. Unlike k-means, it does not make any assumptions about the number of clusters present in the data. So you can run it and it will eventually cluster everything into one cluster and then you can cut it off at each layer and look at what clusters exist as you go down the tree. Another alternative we're considering is expectation maximization, which bears a strong resemblance to k-means. However, unlike k-means, it does not assume spherical clusters, so it can potentially capture much more complex cluster shapes if the clusters we're looking for and the shot types we're looking for in the data are not actually spherical. Additionally, another aspect of the framing decisions that must be made by an editing system is choosing which shot to transition to. Consequently, we're currently doing some preliminary work looking at the probability of transitions between clusters to see if our cluster definitions have any meaning in terms of transitioning. Um, this is also relevant to particularly the salience and whether we divert attention when we transition between clusters. Furthermore, we are also exploring some different feature detectors, including concatenating some of our feature detectors together, um, such as concatenating salience detection with dense pose body detection to try and get a more detailed picture of each frame and a more detailed analysis. Uh, thank you very much. And if you've got any questions, feel free to ask. Sorry, thank you, Harry. So I think uh, I hope that's how I spell that. But uh, so interesting work. So I personally have a couple of clarifications. Wanted Sorry, I wanted a couple you, of Harry. So I think uh, I so think that's how I spell that. But uh, so when you do uh, PCA, you you take the entire map and do PC on it. Like so, it's a if your map is W cross H, you just do PCA. Let's say the map is two fifty six by two fifty six. You just do PCA and convert it into a smaller vector. That's where you do the clustering on. Is that correct? 
Okay. Yeah, so we use the principal component analysis on the yeah the saliency map to reduce the number of dimensions and then do the clustering on the reduced dimensions. Okay. Did you explore any domain specific? Let's say I would, it would be interesting to look at dialogue scenes, for example, and see what happens. You will see, you know, over the shoulder shots or, you know, a particular kind of pattern may come. So it will be interesting to explore this those as well you know also transition is another thing you already said you will be exploring but did you explore like dialogue scenes or some things like that you know more uh, generic no not yet we haven't looked into yeah more generic stuff but that could definitely be an interesting area to look into okay there's a question from alexander so if you're there you can ask on the zoom as well alexander alexander you know oh, I think okay thank you uh, hi thank you for your talk um yeah, uh, I was wondering if you had tried to apply the, the dynamic science models because um, static models like DBDS2 uh, often fail when you have any kind of movement or any kind of dynamic in, uh, in, in the shot. Um, yeah, so currently we're just using static models because we take the center like frame of each shot as representative of the shot as a whole. Um, as opposed to kind of like looking over time. Uh, so no, we have not looked at dynamic saliency models. Yeah. So just for clarification, so which frame in a shot you take the representative, the first one, mid one? Or the, something the, like? Yeah, we do shot detection and take the mid frame as representative of the shot. Zone. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, interesting. So any other questions, anyone? Uh, okay, there's a question from uh, Mr. YQM. So he says, do frames only come from static shots? So I think she just clarified that, I think. So, you know, she's taking the mid frame of, uh, you know, she does short detection and takes the middle frame, I think. So I think he would have asked before we had the discussion. So I think, yeah. So any other questions, anyone? Or uh, I think that's the end of session one then. Hui, am I correct, Helen? So we'll break for lunch here. Yes. Yeah, so we'll break for lunch and we'll start again at uh, 2 p.m. Uh, French time. And we start with the interesting, uh, you know, keynote by Diego, right? So looking forward to meet you guys soon. You know, those who are free can certainly do some discussions over the Slack and uh, try to have a feel of this, you know, some virtual lunch possibly, right? So the Slack is there for discussion and also i think uh, discord if you want to use but i think it's better we do slack we have created some specific channels so i think we can discuss over those you know explore our areas more okay so we'll uh, see all of you again at 2 p.m on zoom okay